Our next leadership dialogue will discuss turning the ESG theory into action. And to moderate this session is Dr. Yahya Anouti, partner and ESG leader at PwC Strategy and Middle East. Dr. Yahya is a partner with the energy and sustainability practice of Strategy and E in the Middle East and leads the ESG platform of PwC in the region. He is a board member of the Strategy and Ideation Center and a member of the University of Texas at Austin Advisory Council for Energy and Earth Resources. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Yahya. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Asil, for the introduction and, and big thanks for the GPCA team for this great effort. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, if we're going to talk about the environment, social, and governance agenda, I thought of going back in time to start this discussion. And, and going back to the book by Dr. Abdul Wahab Sadun that I, I read a few years ago. And it was really an inspiration. And I recalled it just a few weeks ago in Sharam al-Sheikh over the cup discussions. Everybody is talking about the need for a moonshot approach to tackle the climate change agenda. There was just a meeting in Boston about celebrating earth shots related to climate change. And what I thought of is that in the 1970s, 1976, where this picture was taken from, there was a moonshot story. And when you read the book, you get these goosebumps around the achievement that was done and the vision that was there. And look where the industry stands today here in the region. But when I think of the ESG story for our region, I think this could be the next moonshot. And when we put ESG, Jubail, petrochemicals, with our AI team who generates these AI-based pictures, I got this one. I'm not sure it would be the right reflection of the future. But I'm, I'm truly hopeful that this will be our next moonshot in the region and I really hope that someone here in the room will write the book about this next moonshot in the 2030 and the next generation. So what I would like to do in, in my opening remarks before I invite the panelists, I'd just like to cover three things. First, I'll cover what is ESG to bring everybody on board. We'll talk why is it a burning platform for the chemicals industry. We'll talk about what are the pledges that we're hearing about, what are the actions taken, and a bit of our view from the studies we carry out on what are the challenges and at the same time the opportunities. Starting first with what is ESG. ESG is the environmental, social, and governance agenda framework that is trying to bring everybody towards goals of achieving environmental leadership, social leadership, and governance transparency. And there are different standards around the world. And this is one of the big questions that we have, what to follow. And under each one, there are different KPIs. And we're talking about hundreds of KPIs. So each one of them has different definition of what is under E. Is it about the emissions, water scarcity, biodiversity, and so on. When it comes around the social agenda, it's about the chemical safety, the, the uh, labor inclusiveness, and so on. Governance, transparency, cybersecurity. And standards put different weights and put different KPIs. But the theme and the spirit is still the same. When we look at what are the driving forces for this, there are simply two sides. First is the stakeholders. We know that consumers are asking for ESG-compliant products. They want them to be greener products. They want them to be coming from companies that have labor and human rights and so on. At the same time, we are seeing regulations coming on board whether from the financial markets or from the carbon-related markets, putting a price and putting requirements and constraints on the companies. We are also seeing talent preferences. In my role at the University of Texas at Austin, we're seeing that the data is showing us people want to join purpose-driven companies. They want to be part of a bigger problem, of a mission that they are solving for. So they are asking for that. And finally, and most importantly, is those who give the money, the investors, are more and more shifting towards ESG requirements to send their money and, and sort of dispatch. On the other side, from internally, we are seeing examples and hearing inspiring stories about new products and services that are increasing the revenues. We are hearing stories about how shifting to renewable energy, recycling, and waste management decreases the cost. 
how risks are mitigated by considering climate change related aspects and how the productivity of the talent pool is boosted once we embed ESG into the operations. Just to put things in the chemicals context, if you look around you, whether at home or at the office or whether you're driving, the chemical products touch 95% of the goods that we see around us. So imagine if we are putting requirements on industries, how will things cascade back to the chemical industry? More importantly, if we go back to the lingo that I was born and raised with the sustainable development goals, the chemicals industry touches on 10 of the sustainable development goals, whether through their contribution to the pharmaceutical industry, to the next generation of material, to the water treatment chemicals, and so on. And more interestingly, many of the chemical products have great impact on the climate change agenda. Think of the insulation material that is produced. The savings realized are double the energy required to produce this material. So this is a huge opportunity. In addition, think of the lithium-ion batteries that will be produced and the role of the chemical industry in driving the net zero agenda and realizing all these commitments. On the regulatory side, the thing that would hit us as of next year, the carbon border adjustment tax. There are 11,000 companies operating within the EU borders that are subject to the ETS requirements, the, the, the trading scheme in the US, the carbon trading scheme. And they want to create a level playing field for all those who export into Europe. And if I look at the numbers, they speak for themselves. The region exports around 8 billion in products that will be subject to the, to the CBAM under chemicals, fertilizers, polymers, and the other types of chemicals. So this is a regulation that is coming from the EU. Keep in mind the other regulations that are also being floated. From an investor's perspective, based on surveys that we carry out, we are seeing that the large investors are taking this at the heart of their equation. 79% of them said that they bring in ESG into the decisions on the financing they give. They are, putting, they are asking to see reports and performance reports on the companies they are financing and taking this into the core of the processes that they adopt. And we'll hear shortly more about that. If I look at the chemicals industry, and it's not only the chemicals industry, it's like all over the last few years, everybody is going very bold on pledges. Everybody is announcing, we will do net zero. People are announcing under the social agenda whether stuff related to fatalities, the inclusiveness, the transparency on the governance, and the board makes more women employment and, and in senior position and so on. These are great pledges. But the question is about the actions and the trade-offs and the clarity around how are we going to move forward with this. And on the actions, what we are noticing in one of our recent studies is that we are seeing an exponential growth and the number of active chief sustainability officers appointed. And the chemicals industry is taking a leading role in that. When I say active, it means it's treated at the level one position. It means it has the right budget. It has the right authority to influence the procurement processes, to influence the engineering and capital projects processes, and so on. So we are seeing a move from an organizational awareness perspective, and it's becoming a board and leadership level agenda. At the same time, if we look at the data, the reported data, and here we use refinitive data, the gray line that you see here is like the distribution of chemical companies on the ratings. A, on the right side being the top performers on the ESG side, on the left side being the lowest one. And the good news is that we are seeing, over the last four years, we are seeing a shift in the performance towards the right. The average is shifting to the right, and we are seeing major leap forwards on the environmental, social, and also the, the less so on the governance, but also we're seeing that. So there is movement. Here in the region, there is still a gap, and we have to move further forward with this. With these achievements, it has to come that there are obstacles and there are challenges. And the challenges that we are getting from the sensing we're doing with many of you and, and in the industry around the world is that how do we balance between the ESG requirements and the growth targets that we have to report on to our shareholders? How do we bring that in? 
what are the reporting standards do we follow? How do we ensure there is a transparent reporting mechanism to go after? And how do we navigate the complex regulatory environment that keeps on changing? How do we make sure that there is senior sponsorship from the top? How do we deal with the quantification of the return on investment of ESG-related issues? We don't have the tool. We don't have the transparency. Even where the science is mature on the environment-related aspect, technology is still going on a learning curve, and there is still more to do. So how do we quantify that? And how do we accordingly finance it? Specifically here in our region, a recent pulse we carried out gave us three insights. The first one is that there is sponsorship from the seniors and there, is, there are pledges out there. But the question is, how do we bring this down towards the organization and get everybody to sail in that direction? The second one was, you cannot operate in silo. If you are a chemicals operation and you want to do recycling and you want to embed circular economy, I need to have the municipality supporting me. I need to have the infrastructure beyond my battery limits. So what is, we need clarity from the government and, and we need clarity from the regulatory authorities and, and from the policymakers. And the last point we found is that it's something exciting because there is a startup mentality towards tackling this issue. And people are rising from different departments to take the lead and to voice their opinion, voice their excitement to drive this agenda going forward. And it's about how do we enable that? The challenge is how do we formalize it? How do we enable that into the organization? And my humble opinion, going back to the beginning, this region has a unique opportunity to lead on the ESG agenda for four main reasons. The first one, is the availability of green, stable, affordable energy, be it renewable energy that would enable electrification of the processes or hydrogen and so on. Second, we are on the cusp of developing some of the largest industrial zones that, will, that are greenfield developments, and these could be designed under the industrial symbiosis concepts to bring in the smart, latest digital technologies and circular economy concept. Three, we have great success stories on the local content agenda. And these efforts started before the ESG term was coined. So we have the processes that we can pivot from and adopt and adapt in order to get into the ESG-related objectives. And finally, we have the governments who are securing offtakes and enabling through their regulations and policy related to the net zero, for instance, if I give it as an example, the net zero announcement, the circular carbon economy initiative, the green Middle East initiative, and so on. So this is really a unique opportunity. But what I would like to shed the light on is specifically the local content agenda. Whether it's the Nusanid program of SABIC, whether it's ICV in, in Oman or in ADNOC, the Tautin program in Qatar, all these, have shown that we can move the needle. We have adopted them to create localization, to create jobs, to bring in FDI, and to give opportunities to supplier. The question that I want to leave with is, can we take the great successes we have done here to bring the E into the S and also the G into the S to our suppliers, to our ecosystem, and the stakeholders? The great thing that we have today is that we have a panel of speakers that will cover all aspects of the discussions related to ESG. And I'm pleased to be joined by representatives from regulatory authorities, from the chemicals industry, and also from the financing industry. And we'll be discussing over this panel what are the priorities, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, who should take the lead, and how to make it happen. So please join me in welcoming all the panelists to our podium. And I would like to start with His Excellency Mohammed al Kwez, who is the chairman of the Capital Markets Authority in Saudi Arabia. Great to have you with us. And, and His Excellency, in addition to, to having his role uh, in the Capital Markets Authority, he brings in experience from the advisory side and the financial side and sits on multiple boards. So the floor is yours for an opening remark. Shukran jazeelan, Dr. Yahya. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for hosting me. And uh, I can add very little uh, to what Dr. Yahya mentioned in terms of the uh, 
technical aspects of ESG, but I think maybe what I can address a little bit is the why. Um, why is ESG important and why is ESG important right now? And um, maybe before I start, if I can just have a quick show of hands, um, who in the audience is an engineer? Show of hands. Mumtaz, thank you. Uh, who in the audience is a finance professional? Finance, accounting? Very good. Then hopefully you will, particularly the engineers in the audience, will find this interesting. In order to talk about ESG sustainability, maybe I need to talk a little bit about capital and business. When business started, business was conducted by one individual. Uh, you do commerce. And then the individuals collected their capabilities together and started to create corporations. When these corporations started, they were initially actually families, tribes, small groups, who actually conducted business and whose name was on the door. Sherikat Fulan al Fulani, Sherikat al Ail al Fulaniya. And obviously, these businesses would like to generate profits, they would like to maximize value but they also would like to protect their reputation. And protecting their reputation meant that there was always a check and balance in terms of conducting business, generating profits, uh, but also solving for other factors that solve for maintaining their reputation. Now, if we fast forward a little bit, a few years later, capital markets were created. And there was an ability by entrepreneurs, businesses, business owners to raise capital, which was a significant transformation into the structure of economies because it allowed for much larger projects, much larger businesses, much more complex businesses, conducting uh, many more aspirational uh, endeavors. And this was actually transformative to the global economy. And it was transformative because we actually saw this coincided with the Industrial Revolution. However, this had a problem and a byproduct. And that, by, that problem and that byproduct is as capital markets grew, the link between ownership and management started to disconnect. And that linkage is actually one of the core tenets of governance that we talk about, is actually we enforce the linkage of uh, the, the delinkage between ownership and management. When management starts to lead in the name of business and in the name of the shareholders, they have to act in the best interests of the shareholders. And one of the issues of governance is that management sometimes does not always act in the best interests of their shareholders. However, when the delinkage is completely severed, you may actually have issues on the opposite side. And the issues on the opposite side, which is management, can now act, make decisions on behalf of shareholders that shareholders would not have made if they were the owners of the business. The shareholders would not have made those decisions if their name was on the door. And the entire structure of the economy is trying to maximize formation of capital, maximize the ability of businesses to form, but at the same time, try to replicate the reputational impact of having the business whose name is in the door. And now, I think we introduce the concept of ESG. Because recently, a few years ago, we started to see an emergence. And this was an emergence actually came on behalf of the investors themselves, where they said, actually, we are not happy uh, with the things that managers are doing in our name. And we'd like to, first of all, be aware of it, of what is being done. And we'd like to have the ability to make a decision of whether we want to invest in this business or not. And so what emerged is that more and more investors started to consider non-financial, non-performance oriented aspects of businesses as material aspects in making their investment decisions. And whenever investors 
start to look at a factor as material in making their investment decisions, obviously regulators take note. Because our role as regulators, as regulators of the capital market, is to enforce and ensure that investors receive all information they consider to be material in making their investment decisions. And that is why we have become uh, quite interested uh, in this activity. Now, the good news, in, at least in Saudi Arabia, is while not one single piece of regulation has put in place on ESG, already, out of the 10 largest uh, businesses by market cap traded companies, seven of them already have implemented some form of ESG reporting as part of their disclosure requirements, whether it's in the form of a separate annual report or an addendum to their uh, annual reports. Um, the challenge now, and I think we're going to talk about it in the panel, is to think about how do we standardize? Because now the question is no longer um, let's do it, let's do ESG, because I think now everyone is involved. It's now about how do we do it right? And how do we do it properly? And how do I, we make sure that the folks who are disclosing in accordance with ESG are actually held accountable to their ESG disclosures? And that is also the area where we've become uh, quite interested. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. Thank you very much. Ah. Thank you, Your Excellency. Next, I'd like to invite the CEO of Tasnia, Mutlaq Al Murshid, who, who brings in a, a great career that spans the globe with Sabic before taking on this role, the leader of a, one of the largest Saudi industrial companies. The floor is yours for opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's hard to follow the act of my friend, Mr. Al Gouez, but I will try to do my best from the chemical industry side. First of all, I would like to dispel the magic about ESG. If you look at the history of the chemical industry, I'm going to talk about our industry in this part of the world. Uh, we practice the best environmental rules ever at that time. When we built our industry in the late 70s, early 80s, all the plants were designed per the Southern California EPA standard of the late 70s. So that was done really right. We had monitoring in Jubail and Yambu of all gases, all releases. So the industry was actually ahead of a lot in that arena of environmental. Okay, and we did with HSNE, Health Safety Environment, was there, my God, for 30, 40 years in the chemical industry in this thing. We did not call it with a nice fancy name. Our friend, the consultant, lately brought ESG. But we did. We did have it, the E. We've done it. In the S side, we also did actually quite well in that. We did it in the safety of our employees. That's taking care of your staff. We did it actually with our contribution in the society through charities, through others. We also did it by taking care of our employees in their housing need. If you looked at the Sabic companies who started earlier, earlier and was followed by the rest of us in Tasnia and the others, we provided our employees with housing, you know, to host their families in it, and the company financed it and gave it to employees with no interest, just a minor uh, payment. So we are actually practicing the S before it was made such a big thing. If you looked at also at the G, we also did our best in that area without calling it the G. You know, we run our company not by doing things right, but by doing the right things. So we have really done control our plants. We made sure we did not abuse any environment. When we published our data, even at that time, we made sure it's following the best standards. And of course, because at that time, we did not have so much detailed standard in, this, in Saudi Arabia or the part of the Gulf, but actually most of us followed the GAAP rules in America, which was at that time was one of the best rules for financial reporting. Of course, things changed later with the FRIS and all that things, but we did actually. So now you get this kind of nice framework, as Mr. Alguez mentioned, that you get it now all together in one thing. 
And most of the companies today, if not all, in the chemical industry in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf actually issue sustainability reports, part of the annual report. Some of us issue an ESG. Sustainability now is actually a board level committee, subcommittee on the board. Some of us put it part of the NRC, Numeration and uh, uh, Committee. Some of us actually have it part of the executive committee. So we have that. So it's already in the country. We're actually, I would say proudly, ahead of a lot of the advanced countries who started with that. So we have been doing our things right, right things, but without calling it at that time this framework of ESG. But now with the framework out for everybody, as Mr. al mentioned and Dr. Yahya, a lot of us also now complete in the gaps. Like before, you have the E by itself, you have the S by itself, and then the G kind of by itself without calling it G. Now, in the G side, most companies I know of here are really have a system to monitor and control the corporation. And that's important. As Mr. Alguez was saying, yes, at times there is a gap between management and ownership. And I've been in management and executive level in many years, and I can assure you that's very true. That's very true. Because management can be distracted and concentrated in operational, profit, growth, and can forget the side effect of what they are doing. And that is, you know, not, not so good. Now we need to make sure these are together, doing the right things, making sure is you don't make other things at the expense of other things. So important things in life do not conflict. They actually go together. You don't have to make choices between important one and important two. They're both important. There is a way, actually, to make a whole system working together. With that, I thank you much, and happy to take questions later on. Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Songwu, her from LG Chemicals. Uh, Songwu is the executive vice president of uh, LG Chemicals, and he leads the global business and project development for the company. He came, he joined 2020 after a long career with BP. The floor thank is yours. You, thank you very much. Good morning. It's an honor to uh, participate in this great uh, GPCA forum, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to be uh, switching gears a bit uh, from the two previous uh, speakers and, and uh, speak about LG Chem and what we're doing about the E side of uh, ESG with respect to sustainability. As I travel the globe, I meet a lot of industry leaders, and uh, including many of you in this room this week. Uh, you know, I take a great comfort that we're actually wrestling with the same issues with respect to sustainability, and that if we collaborate together, that we will find solution as, as an industry. So thank you. LG Chem is a leading chemical company in Korea that is a part of the LG Group which consists of the chemicals, electronics, and telecommunications. LG Chem has continuously achieved growth since its establishment in 1947, so some 75 years ago, by building upon a balanced and global, globally competitive business portfolio, including petrochemicals, advanced materials, life sciences, and a very important subsidiary LG Energy Solutions, which is a manufacturer of EV batteries. It's a great success in, in sustainability. After COP26, the policymakers across the world are trying to limit the climate change by one and a half degrees. In support, Korea has an extremely ambitious target of 40% carbon reduction from 2018 levels till 2030. Korea is an energy-intensive manufacturing economy, and it is export-oriented. In 2018 stats, Korea ranks top five share of a global manufacturing output after China, US, Japan, and Germany. In Korea, the energy-intensive manufacturing sector accounts for 30% of the GDP and 90% of the exports. Among, among them are iron, steel, and petrochemicals, are the top energy consumers, therefore the top CO2 emitters. LG Chem has set out top five strategic objectives, 
and reach net zero by two uh, in sustainability. We aim for carbon neutral growth by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. We are setting up a closed loop for used batteries and plastic wastes in order to create a circular economy. That being said, landfill zero is also being taken into account for all of our operation sites to reduce waste. We are also trying to keep our supply chain as sustainable, sustainable as possible by managing scope three emissions and ensuring metals we use for our batteries. Battery materials are 100% clean, which means the social and environmental risks are kept to a minimum. Most of our emissions come from electricity and fuel burning. In line with our net zero goals, we are moving very strategically to replace the conventional energy sources relying on 100% renewable energy, including hydrogen. We are trying to lead the era of a sustainable transition by developing crucial technologies and creating a more economically uh, eco-friendly product portfolio. Breakthrough technologies such as carbon capture and utilization, e-furnaces are, e are the key for LG Chem. In order to reduce the bulk emissions that we are responsible for, LG Chem is making all-out efforts by commercializing these technologies as early as we can. LG Chem is making sustainability our competitive advantage and a source of a new growth area. In this endeavor, we are going to invest $9 billion in eco-friendly materials such as bioplastics, recycled plastic, and battery material for e-mobility, and innovative new drugs for our life sciences business. Especially LG Chem has launched the eco-friendly material brand called Let Zero in order to strengthen the competitiveness of sustainable products. Additionally, we believe that assessing the environmental impact of our product at, a, at every stage of their life cycle enables us to reduce our footprint efficiently. Therefore, LCA will be carried out for all of our products by June of next year. Energy transition is nonetheless our major focus, as most of our emissions come from electricity and fuel burning. In line with our net zero goals, we are moving very strategically to replace the conventional energy sources to a much cleaner and greener ones. We have goals to have fossil-based fuel replaced by 600,000 tons per, per annum of clean hydrogen by 2050, 100% renewable energy for overseas facilities by 2030, and domestic facilities by 2050. However, there are supply chain complexities which act as bottlenecks in adapting ESG into our entire value chain. Korea is a renewable resource poor country in that it has relatively low solar intensity and onshore wind speed. Offshore wind is possible for small geographical areas. However, it is not as strong to be economical without subsidy. As a result, the price of the valuable renewable power is just too high to be sustainable for our businesses. Offshore wind power is predicted to be twice as more expensive as the current grid power cost. Uncertainty in policies and geo geopolitical tensions are also making it extremely challenging for renewable investments. War in Ukraine, hyperinflation, onshoring and, and, uh, are some of the examples to consistently turn ESG into action. We must not let geopolitical tensions and conflicts hinder our ESG innovation across the value chain. The renewables investments require strong collaboration between the partners across interdisciplinary business sectors. It also requires strong and robust policy support and engagement with, with government agencies. Rapid technology development and deployment at scale to lower the cost of renewables. But most importantly, we as consumers, we have to demand for more sustainable products and willing to pay for more. Thank you.
Thank you. Last, I would like to invite Ken Graham from Goldman Sachs. He's a managing director, leads the chemicals business, and with like most of his career in the chemicals industry. The floor is yours. I'd like to thank uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Yaya, and the GPCA for putting on a wonderful conference and for inviting Goldman Sachs to this year's event. Uh, in particular, uh, we're excited to be talking about ESG. It's a topic that we're passionate about at Goldman Sachs. It drives a lot of our thinking, and it's a critical component to helping our clients make the right decisions for the future. As you can see from our first slide, we've had a long history in ESG framing our thought process. Our first policy paper was published almost 20 years ago, and since that time, we've invested our own capital in a number of important projects and invested time and energy, including buying a consultancy to help us guide our decisions internally and also our decisions for our clients to make sure that we are ahead of the curve when it comes to this very important conversation. As you can see, it's not an easy conversation. It's got a lot of moving parts. It's got a lot of complexity and has, at the end, a lot of uncertainty around outcomes. Our goal at Goldman Sachs is to try and interpret both and predict how these changing trends will impact our clients and our own business to make sure that our success isn't just today, but exists tomorrow as well. You've heard from the other speakers about the capital formation supporting this change. We like to show this chart to give some numbers to support how, how substantial the investment's been in ESG-focused funds, how material the capital formation, to use a phrase that we, we, we've seen. You know, but real, from our perspective, this is a symptom of ESG. It's not the cause. You know, ESG is a fundamental concept that touches everything we see and we do. And ultimately, this is the market talking to us, initially in small amounts, but increasingly in waves. And it's an important signal for our clients and for our own business. It's very hard in our job to give advice, particularly on how to make money, which is primarily what we do, to talk about ESG in a practical context. And so we like to use this slide as to why does it matter, ESG, if it's not being regulated in dramatic fashion, it's not being taxed, why do we care? Well, this slide shows the practical application of an ESG framework on making business decisions. It's a risk, every business has to evaluate risks, and you can see that on the left-hand side of the tail. How do we evaluate risk is critical to giving good advice. It's an opportunity, and my, my distinguished panelist just talked about the opportunity for his business, but that opportunity exists broadly across our industry. We are the tip of the spear in a lot of ways driving this agenda. And so every business has to evaluate where is the business opportunity. And the middle part of the curve, which is the day-to-day -day application of ESG, is simply what's best practices? How do we reduce our waste? That's good business. How do we think about engaging the best workforce? That's good business. And how do we develop metrics that allow us to tell ourselves and others whether we're doing a good job or not? Last slide, and, and I'll be brief. You know, it's obvious to us, but not always obvious to, to everyone, that ESG impacts every part of our business. And our business is really helping the world finance growth and developing products and services for the next generation. As you can see, it's critical that we get this topic right, so that we can provide our clients with the right advice, so that we can make the own investments for our balance sheet that makes sense for, for our firm, and ultimately help the world succeed alongside those important observations and investments. So again, thank you for having us. Excited to continue the conversation. <clears throat> Thank you, thank you all for these exciting opening remarks. And, and if we start the discussions with you, Your Excellency, 
what are the, from where you said the ESG priorities for Saudi Arabia or more broadly in the region, and what is the role of the capital markets in enabling that and galvanizing it with the private sector? Um, I would say, I mean, for us in Saudi Arabia, the priorities are really a question of where we stand today. And if we take uh, ESG and break it down into its components, the E, the S, and the G, environmental, social, and governance, and if we start with governance, I would actually argue on the governance side, on the G of ESG, we are actually among the top in the world. And this is not just us saying this, this is most global rankings that look at governance in whatever definition you, you define it, whether it's protecting minority investors or shareholder governance, most global rankings would consider Saudi Arabia as one of the top five. And in some of them we are number two or number three. Um, and that is a transition that we've actually made over a very, very short period of time, in over f five to six years. And it was the, the playbook on this was actually quite straightforward. We had a, uh, a, a, a governance code that was not mandatory. Um, we had it for a decade. Um, we completely rewrote it and reissued it, and we made it mandatory. And that, along with a few other uh, provisions, have actually led to creating um, the, the ranking and the status of Saudi Arabia of where we stand today as one of the top markets in the world in terms of governance. Now, if that playbook exists for uh, governance, uh, you can basically ask the question, well, why don't we do the same for the S and the E? Um, and then we will be among the top in the world. Um, I think there, on the two components of S and E, the issue is not as straightforward. Um, the reason being the follows. With governance, um, because of the length of time that we have had in terms of studying governance, looking at governance, identifying governance best practices, best practices around governance were highly standardized. So if you asked uh, 100 people in the world or a million people in the world on what good governance would look like, I think they would agree on about 70 to 80% of those components. And there may be some distinctions on 20% that people differ on. And whenever there is a broad agreement or broad consensus, it becomes very easy to regulate. When we move to the S and, and the E, I think this is when it becomes more complex. Because when we talk about the S, for example, uh, which is social, if I ask a Saudi investor, what do you think is most important when we look at social obligations of corporations? I think they'll give you a very distinct list. And let's say one of the things in the list is localization, Saudiization. What percentage of your workforce is localization? And if I'm a Saudi investor, one of the biggest S's I would want to know about the company is how many Saudis does it employ? Um, on the other hand, if I talk to an international investor, Actually, they're not as interested in that. They're interested in something very different. They're interested in gender diversity in the board. They're, they're interested in other factors. So whenever you don't have standardization, I think you need some time to get to that uh, consensus. And of course, the same with the E in the environmental. When we talk about environmental, there's today a plethora of environmental standards that are available in the market today. Uh, you, uh, Dr. Yahya gave a few examples of this, but even beyond ESG, there are other frameworks other than ESG that are competing on environmental framework, whether it's sustainability and climate finance, whether it's green financing, etc. And each one of them has a different rule book and a different guide and, 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 and a different set of priorities of what they think is important. So uh, a, a broad priority is to make sure that we get to the same level of consensus on the E and on uh, uh, the S that essentially allows companies to both comply and allows us to have a high standards. And I think on the E side, one of the biggest milestones that we, we believe in terms of trying to reach consensus is actually the communique as part of the G20 um, in the last cycle that was led by Saudi Arabia, um, incorporating the, uh, uh, circular car the, the circular carbon economy, which I, sh I think presents a very new framework, which doesn't look at just 
emissions, but the net contribution. And I think it is reaching consensus on the S and the E in terms of what the standards look like and broad agreement on investors, which essentially helps companies both comply and regulators start to standardize. Thank you. So, so going from there, Ken, to you, like, what, are, what do you look for in terms of ESG priorities? And more importantly, when you're looking at different regions, investments are at different, do you look at these specificities or you have? Yeah, I mean, let me comment. You know, my, our worries in this part of the world, what you call developing economies, is these ESG's rules that come in so much around, especially from Western countries, are not used as a non-tariff entry barrier into the economy. For example, the carbon tax in Europe. It's fine, but being applying it unanimously straight on other countries, other countries were now just getting industrialized. Therefore, they're going to have some issues. These standards coming today from certain countries, especially in the West, are, were not applied to themselves when they were industrializing themselves. They're different. Now they reach a high level, so they want to apply these rules on some poor ones, like in China or India or in this part of the world, who are just coming up and we think so they need some break. So to make it and then smack you know, prices on it and smack taxes and do things can be seen from the other side as really a trade barrier. Non-tax, non-tariff trade barriers. So that we have to be careful. Also, as Mr. Goethe said earlier, you cannot, each region has different issues. You know, you cannot take, see, this is ESG in America or in Europe or somewhere, everybody has to go by it. No, everybody has their own specific things, like their social stuff, our social standard, our social religious uh, meaning are totally, most of the time, different. So you cannot take certain issues, certain things in Western society, and you say, you must follow. And we have seen some of it in Qatar, in the FIFA football games. We've seen some agendas that I have it in the West, you must follow. That's not fair. You know, we have to give people time to adjust. We have to get to adapt. Companies need some breaks to really reach certain standard. You can't take a country like Germany or Europe industrializing for the last 200, and you say, now my standard I learned in 200 years must gonna apply to all of you who just enter in. That is not fair. So that was my worry about ESG. It's, it's a good concept. It's great. We say in Arabic, you don't want kilma to haq, you rather ba batal. So يعني, that something has to be clear. I was going to say in, in the Arabic language, so you say something correct, but the meaning of it is not exactly that way. You meant something else. So that's, that's how what worries me and as representative in the chemical industry for the last 35 years. Because when I started in, in, in the U.S. and in Saudi, these things were not there. You know, nobody came and knocked on the door of the biggest manufacturer in, in, in Houston <laughs> and said, you must follow these rules. They were the general guidelines. So we need to give people time to adjust, basically. That's, that's what we're asking for. Thank no, you. We, we don't disagree with that. I Thank think you. When we think about the application of ESG, it's not one size fits all. And we can talk most, most notably about the US and Europe, where we've adopted very different strategies, right? The IRA is a carrot strategy. Cap and trade is a stick strategy. Uh, I think these are competing strategies over time. You know, ideally, competition should drive the best outcome. I have a lot of sympathy, and our firm has a lot of sympathy from the social aspect as well. And I think you know, we, we have certain social guidelines, particularly you know, diversity on boards, that are necessary for us to take companies public in the US that we don't apply in other regions because they're not relevant yet. I think conceptually, the goals hopefully find some alignment. And we will, that. we will. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> it's all time. I think that, but our goal at Goldman Sachs is to interpret what the world's telling us and to really direct that information back to our clients so they can make good decisions. And that's kind of how we think about our role. So, so within your processes, you have the flexibility depending on the region and the sector you're in, or there is a playbook that you have to follow across? There are certain things that are governed by our charter that are global. They're pretty basic things. It's not hard to avoid you know, making the wrong kinds of business decisions on the basic playbook. It's pretty, don't do business with, you know, people who've been in jail, for instance. 
I think realistically, uh, after that, it becomes much more gray. And it depends a lot on the reputation and the relationship. And ultimately, you know, the partnership takes responsibility. And we've made mistakes in the past uh, in that regard. And I think we take that very seriously. And I think that no one's perfect, um, certainly not Goldman Sachs. But our goal is to help the dialogue, not hinder it, by implementing someone else's rules in the wrong context. If we move to the perspective from LG, how do you treat that in your global portfolio and, and in your investments? Yeah, so um, we, we set a clear goal of achieving uh, net zero goals by 2050. And uh, in order to achieve it, um, you know, we're going to have to actually, as we grow the business over the next, uh, you know, 20 somewhat years, that we actually have to consider, when, when, we, when we look at the investment decisions, that we have to take into USG into account as we do uh, you know, grow the business. So it's becoming one of the investment decision criteria, uh, rather than it's kind of, uh, you know, we grow and then we think about you know, after the fact how we're gonna achieve uh, ESG, especially around the sustainability. So that's what's happening globally. And from the presentation you gave, it seems you're putting a lot of emphasis on research and innovation. How are you treating that and how are you driving this agenda and prioritizing it within your portfolio? I, I think it's um, many of the panelists you know, in, in previous uh, leadership conversations yesterday and today have spoken about the importance of innovation and technology. And I think the chemical industry and this GPCA session, the title of you know, chemistry in action is just the perfect uh, title because um, the chemical industry is largely manufacturing centric, but it's actually technology driven businesses. And I think we are best suited uh, in, in, in place to actually drive that innovation to uh, you know, reduce uh, CO2 emissions and, and uh, achieve a circular economy. So within LG Chem, we are actually putting a lot of emphasis on R&D to develop uh, you know, materials that will go into sustainable uh, products, such as uh, solar cells as well as uh, you know, uh, windmills and so on. So I think you know, yesterday, the, the opening, one of the opening remarks said, energy transition equates to materials transition. And I think that's just the perfect uh, you know, soundbite uh, that I take away, that it's going to be very, very important that we drive that innovation to uh, support this uh, sustainability agenda going forward. And when we talk about the research and innovation, is this within your company or you are engaging with the ecosystem, with the startups, with the academia, and how it, are you galvanizing that? Yeah, it is actually both. You know, we're, we're driving the development of technology our own. We're trying to commercialize uh, some of the technology. As an example, uh, dry reforming of methane is a great way of reducing uh, you know, CO2 emissions. And uh, we're you know, piloting that as we speak, and uh, we will try to commercialize it. But we're also working uh, with, the, with the technology suppliers and many of the partners in the in industry to drive that innovation. So we cannot do it alone. We have to work together. And I think that's a very, very key point that I, I also take away from the previous uh, you know, panelist conversations as well. And if I come back to the region and to Tasnia, Saudi Arabia, how, where does the research and innovation agenda, where is ESG sitting within this? research and innovation agenda? Mostly, it's, it's a, a lot of it, it reaches all the way to the board level. Each company has a whole total organization of health, safety, and environment, which was there for years and years. Now people expanding it to ESG subcommittees at board level and reporting that we issue on sustainability, on environment, and social contribution at different stages, but it's maturing. You know, uh, we're not like what you say in some advanced economy. We're a little bit behind Korea, but closer to that kind of things, getting there. But it will take some time for us in this region and develop an economy in the world. The science maturity here in our part of the world, not as high as in the other side. So a lot of the E and driven by science, you know, is technologies, uh, carbon circularities, net zero, you know, all these things. There is a heavy science, as we heard this morning from some of the presenters. So these need to be addressed, and this will take some time. But it's the most important thing. You're not going to wait 
Most important is a lot of us already ahead of the curve, already moving, we're learning from others, and we're moving on. So I have no worry about it at all. Uh, you know, my worry, as I said earlier, these things get used in the wrong direction and be ESG good, but used in, in a different agenda. That's what worried me. Otherwise, no, I don't think anything uh, will object to doing the right things, doing business with non-corrupt regime, non this thing, non that. That's, that's normal. All of us believe in that. It's just a matter of you have to tailor your program to the society you live in. If you want gender diversity, you're all for it. But don't come and tell me here I have to be like a board in Holland or a board in Sweden. You know, I must have this number. It's just a different ball game. We can just, it's not one stick, one size fits all. We need to make the size fits the situation we're in. That's all. Thank you. I'll start feeding in questions uh, from, from the audience. And something that keeps on recurring in most meetings I'm in is like, how will the ESG agenda affect profitability? And I would love to have all of your reflections, starting from where you're sitting. Do you hear, like, is this an opportunity or this an increased cost of operations and how to mitigate for that? Uh, well, uh, I would say it really depends on the the time horizon that you look at. Um, the, uh, um, if the longer your time horizon and the bigger your business, um, the less likely you are to see tension. I think the tension between profitability and between other considerations come to play um, when I'm looking at tomorrow next quarter, next, uh, next month. The longer your time horizon, I think the, 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 the more this is synchronized. And if I can use an example, actually, um, even before ESG, economists used to refer to this as externalities. And economists, even in traditional modes of economics, will always recognize that businesses and economic activities generate externalities. And externalities are these effects that spread to beyond the clients and beyond the shareholders of the business that uh, society at large must manage. And historically, society used to decide the way to manage these externalities is via regulations. Um, so I create more regulations, and I create more complex regulations, and I create more detailed regulations. And I think this has continued for a very long time. The only issue with uh, uh, managing externalities via regulations is as businesses become more complex, and the, the nature of the things that they're operational in become more complex, regulations also become more complex. And, and, and this goes ad, infin ad infinitum. Um, I think the transition uh, with ESG and sustainability finance in general is introducing a new method of managing externalities is rather than saying well uh, uh, any undesirable societal effects uh, rather than having to regulate them away actually will try to enforce that companies disclose them and bring them to light and will try to leave it to the market to decide and to assign a price on this externalities so if you pollute um, it's okay, but uh, the cost of capital will be higher. If you have other social uh, obligations, as long as it's legal, uh, investors are going to assign uh, a, 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 a price tag uh, to this. Um, how will we end up? I think we're still at a very, very early stage in our uh, career, but I would say we have an example that predates ESG. And that example is Sharia finance. Um, we have had Sharia finance um, for um, centuries, um, and it has developed actually earlier to ESG in terms of a framework, in terms of an overlay, in terms of deciding what you invest in, what you don't invest in. And I think today, companies don't ask, if you're a Sharia compliant company, you don't ask, is there a tension between being Sharia compliant and maximizing profitability? Halas, I'm Sharia compliant, and that's... Uh, uh, that's what it is. And I think we're just at an earlier stage uh, in terms of the ESG trajectory. I think for us, specifically in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries, is ESG becomes an additional overlay above Sharia compliance for some businesses. And having too many overlays actually adds an element of complexity. 
And actually, one of the additional complexities that we're grappling with here in Saudi Arabia is to try and see, is there a consolidated framework that we can apply that tries to integrate the required Sharia disclosures as well as ESG disclosures? Because we would like to give investors um, all that they desire, but we would like to do this while managing some degree of consensus, some degree of standardization, and also managing cost of compliance on behalf of corporations. From yeah, them. sure. Uh, I'll address it from an industry point of view on, a, on one by one. You know, environmental compliance in the short term is expensive, of course. You're going to have to build system, you're going to have to build scrubbers, you're going to have to recycle, you're going to have to... But if we took it from the long term, and I have direct experience different companies uh, outside and a lot here and locally, we, the, by the pressure of the environmental side, we found ways to recycle our waste, reduce our consumption, and actually make money. So it was really a profitable business at the end of the day. Stuff uh, we treated as waste and paid money to the environmental company to dispose of, now we found ways actually to sell it by removing certain bad actors in them like heavy metals, like poisonous stuff, and make money out of this. So this is really, so in a short answer for the environmental side, and it will apply to all of them, a little bit cost in the short term, but you must be a long-term person looking at the, especially chemical industry. Chemical plants are built for a minimum of 30 years. So you cannot look at one quarter or one year to make a judgment on investment of 30 to 50 years. So that's attractive. In the S side, the same story applies. If you look at what we do in company here in Saudi, we're providing houses and all these things to employees. By the way, we're not the only one in Saudi who provide houses. The chemical industry in Houston, which first started, Shellets oil and others, they gave actually houses to the employees. Same story we have, <laughs> except that's what I'm saying. We should give people time to adjust. So we came to it, but they were doing the same thing 60 or 70 years earlier. So if you take the cost of housing, we borrow money as a company, we build houses for employees, please pay for it. They don't pay us what we pay as interest and all these things. So it's costly in the short term. However, if you look at the price of attrition, and losing employees and retraining new employees and you add the cost component of this thing, you found it actually, it makes sense to build houses. So, and you know, like the merit, the long-term merit, the short-term merit, you find out it's a short-term costly, but if you look at it from an attrition point of view, a training point of view, I know my old company, Sabic, and I spent tens of millions, hundreds of millions in training. Tosnia has spent tens of million because we're not as big as Savic. So that's costly. So if we can keep those people, then we're ahead of the game. And if you look at the governance, the governance is also very important because as my right-hand man friend here saying, he's a regulator. So if I don't follow the rules, he's going to fine me. <laughs> and fines can be very expensive. Th thanks, Mr. al in Saudi were still reasonable, but if you go into countries like the American things, fines can really hit your balance sheet, can really break you as a company. So we, we, so short term, it's a bureaucracy, it's more papers, it's a procedure, following the IFRS, and doing all these things, reporting, everything. So you have more staff, more paperwork, more controls. That has price. That's not free. But if I take it in the long term, that benefit the company, avoiding any fines, being perceived also in the market as a good company with investors, so it actually has a non-financial benefit to the company. But if we look at it in a short-term perspective, we'll say, no, 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 that's bad. It really cost us money, hurt our profit. But if we look at it in long-term uh, term view, it's actually good. And chemical industry is a long-term industry. Nobody in the chemical industry invests his money and expects to get it in next year, like you do in real estate or stock market. You know, here, you put seven, ten billions building a plant, it takes you five to six years to see the first product. So for this year, you're not getting any penny out of your investment. So you must be a long-term pigeon. That's, that's what I would say. I can't add anything more than that. We, that's exactly our view. In front of a board recently, we had the question come up because short-term returns can be low. Yes. But if it's bad investment decision five years from now, it's a bad investment decision today. 
Yes. And I think from our perspective, we can also bolster that with lots of evidence from other cycles to show that low return initial investments can be game changed in the end. We look at semiconductor, we look at batteries, we look at the cost of those initial investments and the challenges that it, people had to endure, but also some very lucrative outcomes. It's not, it's not unclear that they're doing the right thing is a profitable thing in the long run. You know, I watched, I watched the Morocco game in this room last night. I, I, very exciting game. And I think one of the lessons I took away from it, Morocco could very easily have accepted history and perhaps had a very different result at the end of the game. And they didn't, right? They wrote their own future. And I think that's how we think about some of these challenges. You kind of have to be a little bit brave, but the support's there to show you that it can be profitable as well. I think if I may uh, share a success story, um, the LG Group then chairman, uh, BM Gu, um, in, in 1990s, have uh, studied you know, development of uh, electric vehicle batteries. And uh, so there was a lot of uh, resource going into it, you know, essentially the money and the, and the, and the human capital. And uh, some of the CEO uh, wanted to kind of can that project because it was just costing the company and uh, it was being funded by petrochemical side of the business uh, you know, uh, for, for, for that uh, R&D development. But with the foresight of the owner and the, and the, and the group owner uh, kept on you know, pouring resources into that R&D, which became a great success story of uh, LG Energy Solution, which is uh, globally number two uh, EV battery manufacturing uh, uh, company that generates over you know, 20 billion of revenue uh, uh, a year. At that company, we just IPO'd earlier this year and uh, immediately the market cap of that company was uh, second to uh, Samsung Electronics over 100 billion. So that kind of foresight uh, that we, we also need in, in chemical industry to drive this uh, you know, transition uh, that we're all facing today. So I just want to quickly share that uh, LG Group story. Great. Do, you, do you mind, Yahya, just, uh, just one addition? I'm, uh, I, I think we, there is convergence around the table that over the long run, we don't view there to be a, a, a consistency. But to be fair with whoever asked the question, over the short run, uh, I think there is equally no doubt that ESG is inflationary. Because whenever you have to do business, uh, without any constraints, and I'm now enforcing some constraints or some disclosure requirements, that will have a cost. That, and, and, and I think we shouldn't circle around saying that's not going to be costly. That will be costly. But if I'm, a, if I'm an investor, if I'm a shareholder in a business, I have a choice. Um, and the choice is either I react to the trend towards sustainability and towards ESG, which actually may mean, in fairness, and no, I will need to incre increase my cost, maybe lower my profit margin, etc. Uh, or I may not. And if I don't, maybe nothing will happen. Um, but there's also a possibility that ESG may become an even bigger and bigger thing, and the reaction to ESG around the world may become an even bigger, bigger thing. And some investors have said, actually, I dump uh, 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 shares that do not meet the ESG requirements. So now, as an investor, as a shareholder, I have a trade-off. Do I want to manage for my profit margin, or do I want to manage for my short-term profit margin, or do I want to manage for the risk of essentially someone dumping my stock uh, one day or over underweighting my stock one day? And that's a, a, a trade-off that, that investors need to manage. But I think it is a, a, a discussion that I think it is very important for businesses around Saudi to start having uh, even before regulations come in. Actually, the actions that you all will make today will likely influence the regulations that are going to come out uh, whenever. It seems the room heard you on that short-term cost is higher and came back with a second question. Who will pay for this higher cost that we'll experience in the short term? Is it the consumers that this cost will pass on to them? Or are there some development funds, some other financing mechanisms that will sort of tamper that increase in cost on the consumers? I think, uh, Yahya, in, in, in the beginning, the cost will definitely be shared. I mean, we as industry, you know, built for profit organization, of course would love to transfer every penny cost us into the consumer. 
But that is not possible. We have to be realistic. There is competition, and that's the beauty of competition in the market, that it control these kind of desires. So yes, it will, be, it will affect the, you know, the shareholders. It will affect the company itself, but it will affect the consumers. But if it's good for everybody in the long term, why not do it? Because that increase, frankly, is not significant. You know, that's not huge. If you look at the number of things like in a car, how much plastic versus what other things. So if the plastic increase by 20, 10 percent, is that going to kill the car? It's probably not, because there is other component. Plus, in the ESG things, it also can be fun for employees. We do not look at employees' point of view. I'll, I'll give you an example. We in Tasni had a program where employees volunteers to renovate poor family houses really run down houses. We have them some part in the Eastern province in the city called Masahik. And we have the employees actually going there and renovating the house. The company pays for the material and all that. And people loved it. A lot of our people spending their time renovating old houses. And the company paid small money. It's not big for a, for a corporation of multi-billion dollars. So that also can make things that you think it's maybe cost, it's actually better and retain employees because they're proud to work for a company that taking care of the society in general, especially the society around it, and further. So, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not so bad. It's short term, I agree with my friend Mohammed. It can be, but it's not so huge. But if you, put, if you use it as a trade barrier and use it, in, then here where we have a problem. That's where the problem comes in. But if the increase by itself for applying the things like regulation, rules, and things, this, this is not a problem. Just can affect you a little bit short term, and you can budget it over some time. You don't take it all into an, as long as uh, IFRS rule uh, counting allow you. And it's, it's possible. And we do it, actually. And people enjoy it. I was given the example of house renovation. People love it. Nice. I, I completely agree. I think, you know, um, we, we all have to pay for more. Um, I think uh, sustainability is something that everybody wants today, but nobody is willing to pay for it today. But I think we all have to uh, think about, you know, uh, we, we have to demand for more of those sustainable products and uh, willing to pay a little bit more. I think I suspect that everyone in this room uh, has, can afford, you know, the carbon offset that is required. So I, I flew, thir you know, 14, 13 hours to be here from Korea. And, uh, you know, that carbon offset, you know, will cost me maybe about 300, you know, 400 dollars. Certainly can't afford that, you know, and, and, and I think we all as an individual will have to contribute to that and, and I think demand for more of that product and I think that will kind of drive this uh, transition. Um, I was really glad I'm flying back with the Saudi airli uh, airline through uh, Dubai and it actually shows what the carbon abatement cost is. Actually, it was, I was pleasantly surprised to see that. And, and, and I think as an individual has, has a responsibility to, uh, you know, contribute to that uh, endeavor. Yeah. Right. And, and fr from this experience, like we have here in the audience a lot of employees of chemical companies. What does the ESG mean really for these employees? What are the opportunities? How will it affect them? What is their role in this transformation? I think the, uh, you know, we have new NZ uh, generation that is coming through um, our organization and they are now by far the largest proportion of the, of the employee base. And, uh, you know, they value, uh, you know, ESG a lot more and, and uh, through their education. And I think, you know, as a, as a company, we have to be really selling, you know, that the value, you know, if you get employed, you know, what good are we doing as a company is becoming more important. And, and, and I think that that's the point that, uh, you know, that was made earlier. And I think it's becoming more important as we become, you know, uh, the fabric of that new generation that is coming through. Uh, I think, you know, honestly, it makes me as an employee proud because nobody wants to work for a company that abuses the environment, mistreats its employees or community, violate the financial codes, you know, that's, these are the wrong things. So actually, by engaging the employees and making them see the value of what the company doing for either the community or the environment or the shareholders, ultimately, it's really very positive. And now, especially with the young people, 
who are more of uh, job hopping than us, the old crowd, uh, companies will lose employees if not doing the right things, and then at the end of the day, will end up being a cost. And therefore, companies should, and we all actually doing it. I know in Tasnia, I know in Sabic, I know a lot of us do all these things, but we're not market savvy like some of my American friends that we really market it so good and make a lot of noise about it. We're more of a little bit do good things, but a little quiet. And therefore, I think it's extremely positive impact on the employees, and employees ask for it. Employees ask, like I said, the example of renovation. Employees actually volunteer to work in their free time, not company time. So this is, this is positive. And, and if, if I talk about the youth, what is the youth looking for in terms of the ESG? And second question, from the different countries you're coming from, is the academia preparing youth for these new challenges? We heard about some new products you want to launch. It's very technology happy. Are we ready for that? You want to start from a US view? <laughs> oh, it's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> look, I think we are at an important inflection point. In the US, the culture permits a lot of upward feedback from our employees. That is part of the culture. Uh, that culture has made it very clear that they're going to inherit both the good decisions and the bad decisions. And we don't live in a vacuum, so good decisions will go like this and bad decisions will become more costly over time. And they're also clear that they're not sure that we've always made the right decisions in that regard. And so I think we have an obligation to listen to them. I think there's a wisdom and experience factor you have to overlay on some of that feedback, but it's, we can't exist without our junior people. You know, a third of our company is under 25 years old, I think, last time I looked, in terms of population-wise. And so it's symbiotic, and we need to work with them, the future that they're going to inherit, and I think there's a, there's a practical cost element to it, and then there's a softer side that we also have to acknowledge. Uh, you know, I, I talked to my daughter and son, <laughs> because it's hard for me to say what they exactly want. But if I see from what they're doing, it's clearly, like my son, to him, job security is zero importance. That in our generation, it was extremely important. I go to work for Sabic or Aramco or Shell because I know I can be there almost forever if I'm a good, decent employee, <laughs> you know? So this now generation, at least in my son's case, it's not important. So he wants challenging job. He wants to have to say, have his say in what he does. He wants to be rewarded, but not demanding so much. He wants to be, just to be fair and all that, but he wants to have the freedom to do things. He doesn't want to be told by old hierarchy, micromanagement, to do this, everything. No, now they want to be part of the decision, which is healthy, which is quite healthy. And therefore, the employees, younger generation, is driving the agenda for us in a way, because as business leader, we have to respond to that to attract new talent to our companies. And what we used to as being important, like job security, now is not important. So it becomes something else, like being good citizen, like I'm proud to work for this company because it's doing the right things, by giving me a chance to be part of the decision, by giving me the opportunity to maybe work from home, which in our time was not even imaginable. So these are the things now that affect in what, what the young employees we are seeing. And if I shift gears to the stock market yeah. and, and to foreign direct investment, there has been seen an increase in foreign money into the, the economy and into the region. How will the ESG agenda affect that? Uh, well, Dr. Yahya, the, you, you are very much correct. Uh, and if um, my colleagues recall, uh, Saudi Arabia was somewhat of an exception among uh, most countries around the world and that we effectively had a closed capital market. So we didn't actually allow uh, the investment of foreign investors um, at any viable basis until actually quite recently. Um, when we opened up the market to international investors and when we started to uh, get included on now most global indices, we've actually had roughly about, uh, today we have about 400 billion riyals of total investment 
uh, and foreign investors represent roughly 15% of the free float of the stock market, which is moving from virtually zero about five, six years ago. Um, so it, it has actually been a, a, an element of sustainability on the market, uh, because you remember when you open up the market to international investors, there's often a concern about whether international investors would be a, a force of stability or would they will add volatility. Actually, for the past five years, it's been a big uh, source of stability. However, uh, this today enforces a risk because the bigger the international investment community represents in your local stock market, the more you need to be reactive to uh, the demands of those international investors. And it's not surprising that there is a very high correlation between companies who have adopted ESG and sustainability reporting and companies that have a lot of foreign investors in their, uh, because that's where the demand comes from. Thank you. And a question coming from the audience to, to Song Wu on uh, telling about the experience. What, what drove the success of the biodegradable polymers based on synthetic feedstock? How did you achieve that? What is the, the success behind it? Yeah, so it's a, it's a biodegradable plastic, um, you know, that we're developing is actually PLA from corn base. So it's uh, actually, you know, bio-based, uh, you know, plastic, and it's actually biocompostable. And um, it is more geared uh, toward for single-use plastics, such as, um, um, you know, grocery bags, and uh, that often ends up in, in waste. Um, so I think you know, there is a specific application for that type of uh, you know, biodegradable plastic that, uh, that, are, that are environmentally friendly and that we're going after some of those uh, uh, developments uh, in that space. And if I look at Saudi Arabia uh, on sure. chemical recycling and so on, and then if I shift gears towards the challenges, what are the challenges to make the chemical industry contribute to circular economy and, and in general to move up on the ESG agenda? Uh, you know, there are challenges and there are opportunities. Uh, you know, by being a good citizen, of course, it has its own reward. And we are moving that, uh, that direction heavily, all of us in the chemical industry, to make sure we're good citizens of this earth. And we, you know, we try to do the right things, but we get worried sometimes, even biodegradable and all these things, has its also disadvantages. Some of the additives in these things can be as dangerous as not being biodegradable. Uh, the other things, from my few uh, number of 35 years of experience in the industry, when you did the recycle and you did the things, most of the time you did not get rewarded from the marketplace. When the market goes high, uh, price very high, customer are not going to pay you any premium. They, you know, they switch their talk from recycling, this give me virgin resin. And that's a fact of life, we cannot ignore it. So that becomes a cost to this region when some other region leads certain regulation and then apply it to this region. So that's quite upsetting sometimes to most of us in, in the industry that, okay, we need clarity. The problem with a lot of the rules we see is they keep changing also. For some time, interest of certain region of the world, pushing their agenda and the other region. So that is the danger. We don't see it as such inside the country. We don't see it as such a burden. Yes, as Mr. Lugoy said earlier, they cost for everything. And when you add layers, there, every layer you add, it has cost. In the chemical industry, if I can make a product in one step, it's much cheaper than making the same in three, four steps. That's just simple, logic, chemical. So as long as we see it from our side locally, it's, it's positive and we think we contribute. But we don't like these things being ruled for certain parts to, for certain part of the world benefits. Like, you know, like I was giving the examples of the carbon tax and all these things. You did not apply these rules to you hundred years ago when you were getting up, but now you apply it to those people who's coming up, and this is the danger. But otherwise, it's, it's upward positive about it, honestly. And, and if I look at, uh, at sort of the balance between E, S, and G, where should be the focus for the chemicals industry? You have really to see 
all the side of the equation. There is really no conflict between the three. Okay, they are all important. It's just a might prioritization of what you need today versus what you can wait and do tomorrow from a cost point of view. You know you have to do them all. For example, safety is an immediate thing because if you don't pay for something safety-wise, somebody is going to injured or, God forbid, die or something. So there is no time to wait. There are certain things from recycling and chemical, biodegradable, you have a little bit of, of time, space to, to take time. Of course, it's not forever, but it's not compared to fixing a safety issue that could affect the life of, of an employee or a contractor or somebody. The same thing with the G. Most regulators, thank God, are in Saudi, they give you time. They don't say, smack, today you do this. You have consultation period. Mr. Goh said that most of the rules they issue is actually advisory in the beginning, not mandatory. So that's something you also can build into it, and we really appreciate that. You know, we really appreciate these things. And therefore, they can be all done, but timing can be slowly different. But, but we can manage. Honestly, we are managing most of the industry around the world, but especially in this part of it. Because remember, our industry here is new. So we were lucky, like cities like Jubail or Yamba, built from scratch. So it's done on the best standard available at that time. Then when the standard changes, like I said, the EPA of 1984 in California, we change with it. But you cannot take a city like uh, Ludwigshafen in Germany or other in Houston. They have inherited disadvantage <laughs> of the past and co so costly to renovate and do things, and that gets you somewhere. But in general, here, we're also lucky by having the fact is we started from zero. We don't have the, you know, the disadvantage of not invented here yep. syndrome. Yep. So and, and uh, like... I think if, if I want to take the key takeaways from, from this discussion, we need to have a long-term and visionary view. Absolutely. And there are short-term decisions to be taken. They will have costs, but we need to go after them. Agree. The third message I'm leaving with is that there are region and company-specific priorities when it comes to ESG. What I would like to conclude with from each one of you, if, if we're meeting up, if we happen to, inshallah, meeting up next year in GPCA, what is the one thing that you want to overcome as a challenge to make ESG sort of go into action. And then we test on that hopefully next year. If I start. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> in, I, I think standardization to, of KPIs in particular. You know, that's the, you know, we're an engineering culture. I'm not personally an engineer, but we're an engineering culture. And I think the, the gray area of that, that particular part of the ESG framework is tough on people. And I think people want to do the right thing. Um, and so, you know, that's short of regulation, but is data driven. And I think that we can agree ultimately to a framework for data that helps people make the right decisions long term. I agree. I think, uh, you know, uh, from regulatory side, a little more clarity um, on, you know, uh, uh, the regulation and policies that will drive the uh, innovation and, and the, uh, uh, the deployment of uh, low carbon um, uh, solutions. And uh, secondly, coming down to company level, we've been uh, on this journey for last, uh, the E journey for last uh, two and a half, three, three years. And that, you know, we have these, uh, you know, ambitious goals. And actually, next year, if I came back and you know spoke to you all, all of you here, that actually we've made progress on that you know our journey, um, actually implementing some of the projects that were talked about and that we're commercializing some of these technology, that we see the end game going forward. Actually, I the most one of the most important things is the normalization of standards that fair to every player, regardless if they're an advanced economy, developed or developing, that's very important. For us here uh, in the Gulf, uh, I think we have not done a good job of getting our story out to the public, not locally and in even internationally, because we're perceived as a polluter, as a plastic, as all these things. And we've, in reality, we've done a lot of good things. And we need to get that story out there. 
to the public to see we're really not bad, or as some of the non-NGOs or the groups, you know, certain interest group make the industry kind of bad, kind of, you know, something. We're, while we are not, so we need to get our story out there to the public. I think that's important. In a year, I'm talking, so it's a time frame. Sure. <laughs> you. uh, well, every time I think of one, it gets taken. So I'm going <laughs> <laughs> to pick another one, and actually I would say, um, I don't know if it's in a year, but definitely over the coming period is accountability. Because I think what is likely to happen is all of the discussion today has been around companies need to adopt ESG. You need to adopt ESG. When are you implementing ESG? And I think companies are reacting to this. Yeah. And as a consequence, regulators are getting out of the picture because we would like to give the market the opportunity to react. But very soon, as adoption sinks in, I think the question will no longer be, uh, are you adopting ESG? When will you adopt ESG? It will be about, oh, this company uh, actually misdisclosed. Uh, this company was greenwashing. This company is a, a, a hypocrite. They uh, disclose one thing, but in reality, they do a, another thing. And I think it is making sure uh, from the initiation of the sustainability agenda that you are not uh, working for or solving for the marketing slogan or the advertising slogan because this will, again, distinguishing between short-term and long-term, this will definitely solve your short-term uh, problem, you know, getting a document out there, but this will ultimately bite you uh, one year, will it two years, and, and that will be an even more painful uh, requirement, and it will be even more painful when regulators start to step in and treat it like misdisclosures of financial information, which actually becomes potentially يعني, criminal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. And... Thank you. Thank you.